G'day guys, it's Gus Warland here and I've got a very, very special guest with me, a lady who's going to explain to us uh, what we're going to do this Anzac Day, a day that has been so glorious for so many years, especially in the last 10 or 15. And uh, Gwen, thank you so much for joining us today and talking us through what will be a very different Anzac Day now that we're in lockdown. Won't it? I, um, thanks for having me, Gus. It's wonderful to uh, chat with you and, and be a part of this. Um, yeah, Anzac Day, you know, has always been a day where the nation, you know, the Kiwis, the Aussies have been able to come together and show support and remember um, and be in community with one another. And this year we're going to have to do it in a very separate way. Um, but there's, I've been on the phone all morning and there's lots of initiatives. Um, I'm absolutely floored with how much is going on. There's this fantastic Facebook group called um, Aussies and Kiwis for Anzacs. They have over 200,000 members. They're collaborating with heaps of different organizations. Um, and they're, they're the ones who started the driveway at dawn initiative where you walk to the end of your driveway. If you've got a brass instrument, you bring it, you play the last um, post and you have a minute silence, you know, in solidarity with our veteran community and your neighbors. And so, you know, it's a beautiful way that we can let our veterans know and their families know that they are not alone in all of this and that we're remembering them, their sacrifices and their service. I can, um, I can just see then, when like I started, all these people walking to the end of their driveway, and if you haven't got the instrument, just hearing someone in your suburb, or as you said to me earlier, there's a, the RSLs are gonna blast the last post out, outwards into the community. From what I hear, that's a possibility, yes. So wow. it's, um, it That'd could be, be quite an amazing um, way for all of us to feel separate but connected, you know? Um, how, how many different people are out there doing different things? You said that you're, this community, that Facebook community, over 200,000, that's awesome. So what was that Facebook page again? It was um, Aussies and Kiwis for Anzacs. Okay, we'll make sure we put those details up for everyone. If you haven't got a pen to write them down. So that's a great point, a great spot for people to go. And there's lots of various opportunities and events for them to look at. Yeah, from that and they're side. just listing all sorts of opportunities and stuff. So we've got, you know, the national ceremony, of course, that the War Memorial and the National RSL will be putting on at the War Memorial and televising at 530 at six you've you know to walk to the end of your drive and the rsl has endorsed this and they're calling it light up the dawn which is beautiful take your phones or a candle with you if you'd like um there's also i was just talking to this fantastic group called wounded heroes and they're all about um homeless vets and they're they usually do this um uh, sleep out every year and they've moved it up and they've come up with this idea because of the um, COVID-19 where you do on Anzac Eve, you sleep in your backyard. So you do an Anzac Eve sleep out or under your kitchen table if you don't have a backyard. And uh, which is great because we've got a tent, we've got heaps of friends who are, you know, their kids are out in their backyards anyway. So yeah. why not? Why not get the whole family involved? We'll be doing it. We'll be in the backyard sleeping out. We'll get up, we'll watch the national ceremony, we'll walk to the end of our drive. Unfortunately, I don't play any brass instruments, so hopefully <laughs> someone will hear me. <laughs> I'll have it poised on my phone if I don't hear it, though, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, and then we're doing all, lots of craft, and we're going to be putting that outside. You've got the state um, commemorations that will be televised as well, around 10 a.m., I believe. Um, there's... Oh, what else is there? There's, um, they're invite, they're encouraging people to either sort of invite a vet to your driveway um, during the day or um, make sure, Zoom call them, a friend, a vet, whatever it may be, because there's lots of people who are isolated. So yeah. it's really making sure they're connected, not alone on Anzac Day. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the research is showing that five touch points of social um, touch points is required every day for us to be okay. You know, and I get more than that with my kids every day. I probably get 5 million touch points. <laughs> so Some people you, aren't getting it. When you talk about touch points, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Five social interactions of some sort every day that help you um, maintain a healthy connection to your community. So it might be a Zoom call. It might be something 
um, where you see your neighbor and you have a, a chat from three meters away, or you're even gardening and you're both outside doing it at the same time. You've seen another human being and you've interacted with them in some way. But yeah. that is really necessary about five times a day from what they're seeing. Yeah, we're only physically isolated, aren't we? And I, I've noticed this morning on my morning walk, and I've noticed it now for a few weeks, people are more likely now to say hello, where I'm always saying hello, nearly stopping them and giving them a hug, but I can't do that. <laughs> But I'm sort of, I'm so, even if they've got headphones on, I can see the headphones, I just put the hand up and they look up and they're just that little bit of interaction. And especially I think with the older community who are out there walking, especially by themselves, that might be the only touch point that you talk about that they get for the day, unless it might be a transaction at the shops or something. Someone actually showing an interest, seeing them, saying hello, might really just give them that little lift. It's something so simple. I've had, I've been running and walking in Australia for the last 10 years since I got here. And I never had conversations on a walk or a run. But every time I stop with the kids or people are, were at a, a light ready to cross the street, we're all, you know, we're not standing anywhere near each other, but we're having these conversations. We're checking in on each other. People are asking each other how they are. It's, it, people really need that interaction, but it's beautiful. It's, you know, connecting neighbors in a way that, we perhaps have been neglecting for a couple of years. Gwen, I couldn't agree with you more. I think this is sort of, unfortunately, we've had to have this virus, but it's a bit of a reboot for all of us. And I believe that a lot of people find it very hard to start a conversation or they feel that it's being rude by starting a conversation with a stranger. But it's yep. sort of okay at the moment because we've all got something in common. So as soon as you have something in common, you go, well, what about this bloody virus, eh? Or how are you coping with this virus? It's such an easy, simple way to start a conversation and people are more likely to start that now, whereas I'm hoping that continues that habit once we're through this virus and actually it ends up being a conversation that we have all the time. Yeah, and look, I always have, I've walked my dog and I always talk to other dog walkers because you have that commonality. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hopefully, like you said, it'll just continue and we'll find common ground or we'll be connected enough that we'll see those same people when we're out and about on our walks or, um, you know, interacting in our neighborhoods. It's been good. Now, Gwen, you and I first met at the Invictus Games, which was the most incredible week, wasn't it, in, in Sydney? Oh um just an amazing week and you and i i was about to go up and talk to a group of people i think you had just come from talking to a group of people and we both sort of saw each other and we just hugged in the middle of this staircase and i remember it so well could you tell our community um why you were there at the invictus games and why you're so passionate around service and in particular anzac day and so forth sure i think i attacked you on the stairwell is more <laughs> I didn't mind it. it. I didn't mind it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so swept up in the, the spirit of all of it. Watching Sydney come out for our veterans and our international community and letting them know that they were there, you know, that they supported them, that they were cheering them on. It was just, it was humbling. It was amazing. It was inspiring. You know, one of the things that my kids um, had said was the most amazing thing that they saw a week was a trolley full of legs when they watched the the um you know a prosthetic legs yeah, yeah and they were just like that was amazing mom and the way that it changed their view of disability versus ability and now when they see people they're not afraid to look at them talk to them interact with them they you know it's it's really normalized and actually inspired them to go no matter what i have in my life i can go and do amazing things yeah so it's just it was tremendous but um i was involved in that because i lost my husband to suicide in 2017 and i'm a mom of a soldier who is in who's currently serving in townsville and so i've been a part of this community um for a really long time and i've just decided that i want a better defense force and i want a better community to support our veterans and their families um, and I'll do whatever I can in any way I can to you know help people understand mental health to help people understand how to connect with the veteran community um, and to help them understand that families serve and sacrifice in their own ways too. How have you been able to cope with everything since since your partner passed away? 
Look, it's been a mixed bag. I often feel like a mediocre mom. <laughs> At best. Um, even, with, even with the turmoil and fighting and struggles and all of that and, and Pete's mental health, it was still easier with him here. Um, as you can imagine, it was just, you know, doing it on your own. Single moms are just, you know, my heroes because they, mm -hmm. especially the patient ones, because I'm not one of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm like, I've got a community. I've always had a really good network. And that is how I cope. I make sure that I ask people for help. I make sure that when my mental health starts to fray, I call, you know, peer support advisors through Open Arms, which is a veterans um, counseling service. I make sure that I alert my friends to the fact that I'm not coping so well and the edges are starting to fray a little bit more than usual. I ask people to make me meals and they bring them over and drop them at the house because to be honest, having someone else cook for you occasionally is massive. Um, you know, I really do, I've learned to put my hand up and go, I need help, I'm struggling. Um, and to get my counselor involved when, you know, the wheels really start falling off the bus, which they do. So of course, and, and your vulnerability and your openness, I think is, is probably something that I, I would love the rest of Australia to understand, especially the blokes, to be able to put their hand up and say, hey, I'm not coping very well. I haven't got this all handled. She won't be right, mate that type of attitude is probably the strongest thing that I can try to get across to young men and Aussie blokes to try to stop this suicide rate because it's not how we are brought up. We really do have to relearn how it is to be vulnerable. And that is, that is, I'm finding that very difficult to do that. Well, my husband taught mental health first aid. He mentored more people than I can count about their mental health. Every time someone who worked for him needed to go home because their wife was struggling or they weren't doing okay, he supported them. He made sure that they knew they could keep their job and get their thing, you know, their life together. He put them in touch with who they needed to be in touch with to get healthy and was there for them. And yet for him, because he was that blokey, Australian blokey bloke, like, he just was like, I can't ask for help for me. I've got too much. There was too much shame. There was too much disappointment in self over, well, you know, I, I'm disappointing myself here. I should be able to do this. I should be able to just get on with it. And he couldn't. And, you know, when you can't do that, it's not weakness. Um, reaching out to people and telling people. And when you, when the option is reaching out for help or losing someone, like, you know, how, how is it that we can't go, I need help right now, you know, and, and I, I was really struggling the other day and um, I reached out. And one of the things that my son, Tom, and I talk about a lot is personal responsibility. You and I can sit here and talk as much as we want. We can encourage people as much as we want, but they have to take responsibility for themselves. They have to look in the mirror, Gus, and say, I'm not okay. I want to get better. I don't have to live like this. There is a better way. And then go and do something about it. It doesn't matter how scary it is. Because to be frank, you're worth it. I'm worth it. Absolutely. The, I, I remember doing the Man Up program. I spent some a time with some soldiers and there was one bloke. He was just, he was just one of the best blokes. He was so lovely. And we were having a chat and he said to me, Gus, um, let me tell you a story and how I turned the corner. And I said, yeah, please do. And he said to me that he was driving along with his kids one day and he had the kids for the weekend. He had split away from his wife after he'd come back from a couple of tours and he was lots of stuff going on and they were having a separation, but he was hoping that they'd get back together again. And the car broke down and they sat on the side of the road and he was up in Queensland. So whatever the Queensland NRMA is, he rang them up and he said, oh, all sorted kids, the car will be here in half an hour and so forth. And the guy came and fixed the car and they drove off and stuff. And he was so happy that it all worked out and their day hadn't been ruined, but having to be parked up on the side of the road with the car not working. And his daughter was in the back and she was just obviously really thinking deeply. And he sort of looked in the rear vision mirror at her and said, what's, what's up, darling? What's happening? Um, and she goes, Dad, why can you reach out and ask for help? when the car's broken, but you can't reach out for help because you're broken. 
like this child was about eight years old yeah. and hardly seen dad six months here, a year here. He'd been off, he'd been on three or four different tours and he, she had just sat there and watched the relationship between him and the wife and so forth. And as an eight year old, she worked it out and he just went, Oh my goodness. Like, how can I not see that? And that was the trigger point for him to go, right. I'm going to ask for help because my, my, he got permission from his daughter to ask for help and that allowed that to happen. I'm wondering why we need to go to so much trauma. Like we can cry when our sports team wins, when at a funeral, at a wedding, if a mate does something awesome, the winning try in state of origin or something like that, we all jump up and down and we cry, and so, but we can't cry. We haven't got permission to cry when we're struggling or to reach out. Like to me, and I think I've, I've, I've swallowed the Kool-Aid. So it, to me, it's like, of course you can do it, just do it. But yeah. I also appreciate it's very hard for a lot of blokes. But I think a lot of men think I'm not that bad. I'm not like the people who call Lifeline. Like th there are other people who need this more than me. One of the, um, the most amazing men I know is um, Ben Farinazzo. He won a couple of golds at, um, a lot of people know who he is. He's a, a legend. Yeah. And uh, he won a couple of golds at the Invictus Games, and he just does an enormous amount of work in the space. And one of the things he says is, when I picked up the phone to Lifeline, I said, I don't think I'm the right person to be calling. And they went, you are exactly the right person to be calling. It's all of us. And they, Lifeline can take you from, I'm feeling a little shaky, to you know, the wheels have fallen off the bus and I'm on the edge. Um, and they can, you know, help everybody. It doesn't have to be, I think we all have in our minds, the people who aren't coping and the people who are coping. And we tend to be somewhere in the middle there and we don't think we're over here. Yeah. But we don't have to be all the way over there to get help and support. And actually, the, the sooner we get it over here, the less likely we'll end up over there. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we don't talk enough about that prevention, that early intervention, Gus, where yeah. we've got to go, or we have to have something dramatic happen to us. Yeah. You know, well, really dramatic. Lose a friend, lose a husband for us to go, okay, enough, I actually need to drink the Kool-Aid and see what this is all about. Yeah, and I find when, we, when people come to the programs that we support, or if I'm talking to a group of blokes, whether it's school or blokes nights or something, they're all sitting there like sponges. They can't wait to get the information. And then they realize, they look around and they go, well, yeah, I'm not the only one here. I'm actually in a bit of a tribe of blokes who are just sort of bumbering along a little bit. You know, we haven't quite nailed it down or I'm not quite happy with where I am, but hey, it's all right to be bumbling along and stuff. I don't need to have all the answers and stuff, but the stereotypical Aussie bloke, and I'm sure it's the same in the States. I know you grew up in New York City. I certainly know it's the same in, uh, in the UK and I certainly know it's right across all the uh, various forces is this, no, no, I've got this under control. This is, what I, this is what I do. And my job is to do this. And I don't really want to tell anyone that I'm struggling. And I don't feel that I don't want, I want to bother them with it. That's the other thing. It's like, mate, please, I prefer to have a chat to you for hours and hours rather than turn up at a bloody funeral. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we're terrified of failure. You know, like one of the things I got really good at doing when I was young was failing. I fail a lot. I'm wrong <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's like, well, we've got it's that like in my common superpower. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my super power. Failure and getting things wrong. It's awesome. Um, Mrs. <laughs> failure. Here she is. Yeah. <laughs> but I just keep getting back up. You know, but like I remember the first time I went to counseling and I cried for a week because I thought I had failed myself. I thought I had failed. I should be able to do this on my own. Um, there, you know, how embarrassing to tell people that I need to get help. I mean, we go, I mean, and it's silly. We go to the doctor for a head cold. We go to the doctor when you get man flu. We go, you know, like you Which get all the real thing, stuff by the way. checked out. It's a real yes, thing, man, right. Flu. So yeah, and women, don't be so flippant women can't with that. get it because we're too busy looking after the family, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the luxury of getting man flu, gentlemen. <laughs> fair enough. Fair it's enough. Me, it feels the same. <laughs> well, I've had this argument with my wife for years. I reckon toothache's much worse than childbirth. 
I haven't, oh. won, that, I haven't won that discussion ever, but <laughs> I went, I said, it can't be any worse. Like, oh my God, the tooth's hurting so much. And she's like, wow. How about we do an extraction without any Novocaine? Then maybe we'll think about you understanding the pain of childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's been so wonderful to talk to you and thank you so, so much for your time. And I am so looking forward to Anzac Day for a whole lot of different reasons. My Anzac Day normally is um, go to the SCG or go to the Allianz Stadium and watch my roosters up against the Dragons. But by but been in the pub since 10 o'clock, go to one of the local um, RSLs at 6 o'clock, and it's awesome. You get doled up and away you go and it's a great day and my son's joined me the last few years as well at the footy and I've really enjoyed that experience this year very different but just as important I spent some time at Anzac Cove back with Triple M a few years ago now and sleeping in a sleeping bag looking out over the water and just look thinking back to all those years ago those brave men coming on the boats and coming in and trying to do what they did quite amazing so um, I'm looking forward to this new one, going out to the driveway and hopefully someone in our street or area will have that last post blaring. Yeah, I, um, look, there's heat, like I said, there's heaps of initiatives. There's lots of great stuff. You know, like I said, we're going to be in our backyard, sleeping out under the moonlight, wake up at dawn, watch the ceremony, walk out to our front lawn. We'll have done some craft and have, um, you know, a wreath made of, um, egg cartons on the front <laughs> mailbox. We'll have our moment silence. Um, we are going to do it this week. We're going to do a virtual choir. They're uploading um, the Aussie Youth Choir is uploading the Australian New Zealand national anthems and waltzing Matilda. So if people are interested in doing videos of themselves and uploading that, go to the Aussie Youth Choir website. Um, there's Cardly where you can actually connect with uh, a greeting card and send a veteran or their family a greeting card that says, thank you for your service and sacrifice. Um, and those are Beautiful. $4 and the, the proceeds are going to legacy. Um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Have a look um, and know that, you know, people will feel that energy. They will know that they are supported and they will be um, a connection. And I think just that, power of that remembering and, and honoring that time um, is something that is something important we keep doing because not only are you know a hundred years ago but our soldiers who aren't here right now the yeah. men and women who are serving our country overseas right now um, yeah. you know and, and remembering them and their families and and the sacrifice that they, that keeps going Unbelievable. And I, I, I was so impressed when I was at Gallipoli at how many young people had that as part of their gap year. You know, I have to be in Istanbul and then we are making the pilgrimage down to Gallipoli and I'm going to be there. And I'm doing it for my granddad or my, my dad or my aunt. And it was incredible. And the, and the spirit amongst on that evening in the, in the, the, the eve of Anzac Day was just unbelievable. So it's different, but we can still make it extremely powerful and important. And Gwen, it's always an inspiration talking to you. I can't wait to talk to you again. And when we eventually get out of this virus, that big hug is coming. Cuddling you. <laughs> you Thanks so it. much, Gus. Thanks for talking about Anzac Day. You guys take care and thanks for all the work you do. Same to you. Good on you, Gwen. Bye, mate. Bye. See ya.